here and what your connection, how long you've been connected to Nonviolent Peace Force. So I'm gonna put up the poll and launch it and ask you to go ahead and respond. So we'll end the poll when we're ready to get started. We still have people in the waiting room to get in. We had about 180 people registered. So we wanna give people a little bit more time. So welcome, if you're just joining, I'd encourage you to respond to the poll that's up on your screen. You can scroll through it. There's three questions we're asking um, and wanna help understand who's with us on the phone today and what your main interest is in being here. And we'll get started in just a minute. Okay, I think we're gonna go ahead and get started. Um, we have about 90 people here with us. Welcome to all of you. Um, we're really, really happy that you're here and looking forward to this hour together. Um, and really we're going to be discussing today um, how Nonviolent Peace Force, how we're thinking and planning for unarmed civilian protection programming in the United States. Um, as you know, you're gonna be muted during the presentation and the Q&A. Um, but we'd like you to write questions in the chat box and we will be addressing those at the last 15 minutes or so of the, of the hour. We've done everything we can to prevent anybody from hacking into our meeting. If that does occur, we will be removing that individual as quickly as possible and resume um, our presentation. Before we um, begin, as I wanna just, I'm gonna go ahead and end the poll. I just want you to be able to, to look at it. We have. 86% um, are from the US, 3% from Canada, 3% from Latin America, Caribbean, 3% from Africa, 10% from Europe. We don't have anybody from the Middle East or from Australia. Um, most of you have been involved with Nonviolent Peace Force It connected uh, 11 to 20 years, that's 39%. Um, and we also have a lot of new people at 20, 29%, so welcome. And your primary reason for being here today, it looks like 44% um, a supporter and want to support Nonviolent Peace Force's mission. And then 34% um, a, a looking at worried about an increase in violence in your own community and looking for concrete and inspirational ways that nonviolence can be used to make a difference. So thank you so much for um, looking at that. That really helps us and it helps us know kind of who's, who's here and what as a collectively as a group we are um, hoping to get from our hour together. We're really fortunate to have, um, oh, I didn't share the results. Sorry, I meant to share the results. I think you can scroll through it, scroll through it so you can look for yourself, I apologize. Um, we're really fortunate to have Nonviolent Peace Force's Executive Director, Tiffany Easthome here to moderate today and to 
um, serve as facilitator of the conversation. She's going to pose the questions to Amel Duncan, who is a co-founder and director of advocacy and outreach for Nonviolent Peace Force. Rosemary Kabaki, who is our head of mission for Myanmar, but is on loan to the United States to help do an assessment about work in, um, in the United States and also in the Twin Cities and then also broader um, around the country. And then Jessica Skelly, who is also here working on the assessment. She has served in both Iraq and South Sudan as a security advisor for Nonviolent Peace Force. Um, I think we're in for a really uh, interesting conversation and um, really look forward to you um, participating through, through the chat box. Um, so we're going to start with the questions and answer. We will have about 15 minutes at the end where we'll be taking your questions and um, then we will also be having a very uh, a short um, a presentation by a volunteer who will be also um, asking for your support. So I'm gonna turn it over now to Tiffany Stone. Hi everybody. Welcome back again uh, for those of you who are returned and welcome um, if you're new to our group for, as Mona said, our seventh non-violence uh, cafe. Uh, as always, it's great to see so many people uh, tuning in to these conversations. It really tells it's inspirational to all of us to be able to share this space. And it really tells us we've all got a lot on our mind these days, um, really around issues related to conflict and how that, that sparks violence and, and what are some alternatives. So as heavy as, as things have been, um, the, there is always opportunity for change and, and for development uh, in better ways. So hopefully this conversation will help continue to, to share uh, what we're working on and lead us all down uh, that path together. Uh, so just to kick us off, I just wanted to, to talk for a, a, a few minutes about um, how actually for quite some time we've been thinking about uh, programming in the US. Uh, and it's quite a bit beyond just the, you know, we have lots of supporters in the US, our founders, um, our, many of our founders are from the US, and um, so that makes sense. But also because we have been watching for, for some time some really concerning indicators, sort of signs that there could be breakdown um, of, of uh, relationships uh, and more, more like really concretely escalations of violence, certainly in, in small scale pockets and more and more as everybody knows more recently, excuse me, <clears throat> potentially in larger scale. The work NP does, I mean, we work in, in violent conflict, so we do a lot of an analysis. We, we're trained in conflict analysis, we're trained to look for these things. Um, and we're all really oriented to think about developing countries, fragile, what are known as fragile countries, fragile contexts, as a place where we should be paying attention to these indicators um, and these concerns, and, and we're pretty practiced at thinking the uh, industrialized world or the global north is something we don't need to worry about. Things are, there's, there's systems in place, there's, 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 there's the rule of law, these kind of things, it just could never possibly happen there. But I mean, and, and given the percentage of people from the US on this call, I mean, as you well know, when you put all together what we've been seeing in recent years, um, and re years that do predate the current president, um, oh but some really clear indicators like the widespread use of weapons in civilian hands uh, and the prolifer so the prol proliferation of weapons and in this case well beyond self-defense handguns but automated weapons, military grade weapons, the formation of self-identified non-state armed actor groups. So for many years we've got, have had groups in, in the US identifying as militia. They're self-identifying as militia. So a, 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 a sub-state structure of people who are indicating that they are, are going to take certain things into their own hands. It is an indication that they either do not trust the state to be able to provide, to meet their responsibility as duty bearers for, for community safety and security, or they have they disagree with the way things are happening or they disagree with the agenda. And that's been picking up speed, I guess, as we as we all know. 
We've also been seeing the, the dismantling of, of certain institutions. And, you know, one thing that's always been really impressive with the U.S. is really strong institutions, the separation of, of, of the different branches of government to be able to protect from individuals and to protect from, from weaknesses in some areas that can be held up in other areas. Um, and of course, we've seen uh, a lot of uh, dismantling of those services, privatizing, corporatizing of things like, like disaster responses, all of that are, are worrying. And then uh, the real deep entrenchment around identity politics or identity um, um, grouping where people are, are turning into smaller and smaller um, groups of commonality, uh, whether it's based on ethnicity, race, color, religion, whatever that is. And that's a very common indicator that, that you, there's a high risk for, for uh, of widespread outbreaks of violence. So these are some of the concerns that all of those things are in place right now. And then of course you have the pressure of an election and, and all the, 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 the issues uh, related to, um, to the, to the use, misuse of state violence, the racism that's really manifested, and of course we add in that the pressure of the global pandemic. So this all to set the stage to say that it, it, it would be very, we would very comfortably, if it was another place, if it was a place like South Sudan, where I spent a lot of time and we were describing it that way, we would say, well, yeah, that's a country that's, that's really on the precipice of some pretty big problems. And it's hard for us to imagine that that is true in a place as developed and, and with as big of an economy as the US. So that's what we're here for. Um, and sort of really, really thought if, if there was ever a moment for to really investigate and, and think about how NP could be a contributor uh, to trying to, to help prevent violence and help try and help to look at alternatives. This is this is a, a, a really important moment to do that. As always, our caveat with everything that we do is there's these are very complex problems. There's no singular solution to anything. Uh, so as as great as as uh, our I think our work is and the approach that we take, it's also just a contribution. It can, it can only be a contribution. We need complex uh, approaches and, and multi-directional approaches to complex problems. So that's a bit to set the stage where we are right now. Um, and I will hold it there and turn it over to someone beloved and known to most of you. Many of you um, are one of our co-founders, uh, Mel Duncan, uh, who's gonna set the stage uh, of, um, for us more in, in much more detail about what's happening in the US and sort of frame what, where we're, where, what our approaches are in terms of the work that we're doing. So Mel, I turn it over to you. I think we just need to unmute him. Yeah. Oh, we had a moment. <laughs> Still struggling with the unmute. Okay, um, I'm not sure. Okay, here we are. Here we are. <laughs> well, hello everyone. It's, it's good to see so many old friends who have been with us now uh, for decades, but also to note that there's 30% of us who are new. And that is always uh, the most hopeful thing for me in a very bleak time. I, as I was reflecting on what I was going to say, say this morning, I was reviewing some of the newspapers and going through just today's headlines, uh, Trump's new foe, the election, extremists see license to act from president. Uh, going on, uh, COVID reports up, burned by riots. And then just down at the very bottom is a little box that says Greenland ice sheet loses mass at fastest rate in 12,000 years. That's almost an afterthought at this moment. So I find today reading the newspaper really um, is a time for grieving and lament for me. And then going from there uh, to prayer and meditation and then committing to what it is I can do today. Terry Tempest Williams, uh, wrote in, recently in, in 
an obituary for the land, that we are at a breaking point as a species. That, at that breaking point, we can either shatter and be destroyed or we can open and bloom. Those options at that breaking point are here. Tiffany went through the indicators that, are, that we've been seeing. We have trigger points coming up in the next couple of months that reinforce what those indicators are. Trigger points like continued adverse court rulings, as we saw last week in the Breonna Taylor case. Trigger points in terms of continued police brutality. Trigger points leading up to during and after the election. I think the chances of us seeing violence in our communities across the United States are higher than any time since the beginning of the Great Depression. Now, with those trigger points also comes opportunities. And there are really three types of strategic nonviolence that are applied. And you can see here uh, on the slide. And it's important to know the difference, but I want to emphasize that we need the application of all three of these approaches. The first one is uh, using active strategic nonviolence to change the status quo, or what we call civil resistance or direct action. And there uh, is a lot of organizing going on and training. I will put some resources in uh, the chat box when I'm done speaking. Uh, and that will be necessary. We see uh, examples of that right now, for example, being led by Black Lives Matter. There's a second form of the application of strategic nonviolence, and that's to protect the status quo, to use nonviolence for civilian-based civil defense. And that's really what the Standing Rock Sioux Tribe were doing in 2016 and 2017. They were not there to protest or do civil resistance. They were protecting their land from incursion. And then the third application of strategic nonviolence that we'll focus on today is unarmed civilian protection, using strategic discipline nonviolence to protect civilians and to prevent violence. So it's important that we understand the difference between these applications, but also recognize that we're, we're going to need all three of them and we're going to need to cooperate better than we ever have. Right now, what we're doing in the United States, Tiffany mentioned uh, Rosemary and Jessica and Marna and others are uh, doing an assessment. We're actually doing an experiment. We're looking at, have the lessons that we've learned in places like Sri Lanka, South Sudan, Iraq, Myanmar, are any of those lessons that we've learned applicable to the context in Minneapolis and in the greater US? And we found some interesting entry points and Jessica and Rosemary will be getting into the specifics of these uh, in a few minutes. But we found that the Service Employees International Union is interested in, in working with us and not only to do training, but to see that these unarmed approaches get put into the state certification for private security guards so that they, these uh, civilian approaches are required to be licensed. We also uh, are working with a neighborhood patrol in uh, the middle of the black community who will be starting to I patrol their neighborhoods in anticipation for the uh, coming e elections and want to go through uh, the training on unarmed civilian protection. Most, uh, it, uh, I think, excitedly, uh, Jessica and Rosemary and Amira and I have been working with a gang diversion 
or I organization, working on nonviolent approaches with young men between 16 and 21 uh, who are uh, looking at how they might do unarmed civilian protection in their community. We also, in the week after next, will be providing training for the Minneapolis Public Schools as they have created, uh, they have decided to no longer have police in the schools, uh, but security specialists. And so we will be helping to train them the week after next. And then of course, organizing and supporting local teams in selected areas uh, to do unarmed civilian protection in the coming months. So right now I'm, I'm living in a paradox. As I say all of this, I think we never, we'll never have enough. There's just too much, it's too overwhelming. And at the same time, I know deep inside of me that we have everything we need to create a culture of peace and nonviolence in the here and now. We have everything we need. One of those resources that we need uh, is Rosemary Kabaki, who has come and has been working with us in Minneapolis for the last uh, two months. And it's been a, a real pleasure to work with both Rosemary and Jessica. So Rosemary, please. <clears throat> Thanks, Mel. And, and just to warm us up and, and get Rosemary started. Rosemary, can, can I ask you a question get, and, and get you to, to, to say, how do you see the work of NP really concretely opening space for dialogue and helping people to reimagine or rethink public and community safety based on the, the assessment and the training work you've been doing now? Um, thank you very much, uh, Tiffany and, um, and Mel. It's been a fascinating time in the US, particularly because uh, I have worked in a few other countries that are also trying to, to reimagine what security means for them. And it is, has been fascinating. And if I may build up on what Mel just talked about, for me, I see these linkages that NP is starting to create as the genesis of a way that uh, we can take these uh, resources that are within us. Um, so for example, uh, we initially started by having a conversation on schools and how we can be part of the training of the replacement of the police. I've been fascinated to then see coming from that uh, that we, we have engaged with a group of people who are wanting to do gang diversion and giving the same training so that that training that happens in the schools on unarmed civilian protection and how to reimagine security for the youth in school continues outside the school where these same students leave when they have left the school environment, they go outside and they find amongst themselves their peers who also are wanting to engage and reimagine what security is. Again, I'm fascinated to see, as Mel says, we have some security guards also asking the same questions. So I have this image of this youth coming from school and having an understanding of security uh, that is different from direct response to an incident of violence, but what can you do before, during, and after? And they go into their neighborhoods and find similar conversations going on, being coming from a different perspective from this group of uh, interrupters of, uh, of, of violence in the communities and the security guards they meet as they walk around in the malls also will have undergone the similar training. And I find this opens up a way for the community to start building the linkages that Tiffany you talked about, about some of the indicators that um, maybe one of the things that we need to reimagine how our relationships are and how we have collective responsibility about security for ourselves. And the most fascinating thing for me is also meeting maybe some church leaders who are also asking the same questions. And fascinatingly enough, when we asked the youth uh, yesterday, actually, what would you like from, to start building the bridges with? That's what they talked about. They said we would like to go to elementary school and start talking with the children there 
be your peacekeepers now and share with them some of these aspects that we've learned. And then even more fascinating, we will use the churches in our communities because there's distrust between the elder members of our community and the youth who tend to be perceived as violence uh, instigators. And now we want to change that conversation. We want to introduce them to youth that are starting to have conversations on how to address differently. So how are we doing? As Mel says, it is an experiment. But we are very lucky that it is an experiment where we have all the materials in the community. Already we have found so many people willing and able and committed to engage this. And the methods that we are teaching them give them tools that they can use beyond what they already have, they can add on to it, they can adapt it in their context. And in this context, I really see a, a role for this work to happen over a period of time. I think time is a challenge. Uh, wherever I have worked, it has sometimes taken three months, six months, a year. <laughs> but violence isn't going away in our communities until we do something about it, until we, we contribute to changing this discussion. So this is what I feel right now after only eight weeks in the US, uh, but so many indicators that it is an experiment that has a lot of support that with so many people with great heart and great vision on how they would like to see peace in their security, in their communities. Thanks so much, Rosemary. Uh, and I think that, that point around time is really important. Um, these are, these are long engagements. There's, there can be short, quick interventions, but really, changing attitudes, changing behaviors, as we see, this is true everywhere. It just takes a really long time uh, to really heal and to, to build, build new ways of thinking. So thanks for reminding us about that. And Jessica, uh, would love to hear from you. Uh, as, as you heard in the introduction, Jessica has, uh, Jessica really understands security. She's, she was our safety and security advisor in Iraq and South Sudan. So she's been on the front lines of a lot of, of, of tough locations uh, and, and really understands uh, what it means to work with armed actors and how to keep people safe. Um, and so great to have you there. And just, I think people are always really curious about sort of concretely what do we mean when we're talking about this. Could you talk a bit sort of concretely about how you think this will work in the school specifically, in the school, school setting? Yeah, sure. Thank you so much, Tiffany. And hello, everybody. Um, I'm just so excited to talk about this. Uh, to set the stage a little bit, let me describe a little bit about what's happened. So I know that many of you are, are uh, across the United States and international as well. Um, traditionally, here in um, Minneapolis, uh, there have been 